Hello, Bible readers. It is Thursday, April 8th. We are reading from Isaiah chapters 49 to 53. Lots of familiar stuff in there. And then we've got Romans chapter 14 through 15, 21 ish. Uh, to finish yesterday's section of Romans, I just wanted to say uh, a Christian's moral obligation is made in the context of knowing it's almost daybreak, according to Paul. Like, as Paul's writing, how it is we are to regard the outside world, how it is we are to judge each other or not judge each other. All of it is in the context of the full reign of Jesus is just around the corner. It's so close. We live in a now but not yet world where Jesus has, has been here, has died, is risen. And so the foretaste of the feast to come has come but not completely and it's in that that space that paul is speaking his moral uh exhortations into chapter 14 starting with verse 1 going to 15 13 is a section where Paul is saying God calls us to a unity of life and worship that crosses barriers of custom and ethnic identity. That's what he's trying to really get through to the Romans. Uh, he does not dwell on, and notice he doesn't use words like Jew and Gentile or circumcised and uncircumcised in this section as he has in other sections and as he has in other letters. Um, instead, Paul here speaks of weak and strong. That's something to note because Paul typically speaks of Jew and Gentile, even in this own, even in this letter. Uh, we do not live to ourselves. We do not die to ourselves. That is a section that's speaking to judgment and how judgment is God's, not ours. And instead, so instead of judging one another, he's saying, let's offer mutual welcome uh, as Christ welcomed you. So that's where this whole idea of all are welcome, uh, I think that's, that's where it's rooted, is Paul's urging of the early churches to, uh, to do this for one another. Okay, Isaiah. We have got... Um, I'm, I'm having um, a hard time sifting through what Isaiah... Prophets always kind of kind of challenge me not kind of prophets always challenge me and isaiah especially it's just it's thick with metaphor and context and in order to read it you really do need to know the history of things and then it's hard to know well, where are we right now in the history of things is this pre-exile post-exile during the exile because that matters a lot and and as we jump around in Bible readers a little bit. I mean, we're even, we're, we're going as chronologically as we can. And yet we still, it's like, okay, second Chronicles goes forward. And then we go back to Kings and now we're in Isaiah. Um, so anyway, I'm just admitting that maybe you're feeling that too, but we, we continue, we trudge on just 11 weeks to go, I think, or something. Um, so the first section of second Isaiah introduced God, a divine council, Israel, Cyrus. Um, it was a single divine voice from a trial setting. That's, that's so far in 2nd Isaiah, that's, that's what we've known. Um, now, in, in chapters 49 to 53, it, it's different. A new voice is added, the prophetic voice, a prophet's voice. Uh, we hear, and now the Lord has sent me uh, and his spirit. So now that we're, we're not just in a trial setting where, where God is talking, now we're reading things uh, from the prophet's mouth, and the prophet writes these servant songs, uh, including a suffering servant poem, that's probably the most familiar thing we have. We, we just read it, actually, on Good Friday last week. Um, sometimes 
that suffering servant poem gets interpreted as a prophecy about Jesus. Other times, not so much. Um, but as I read my commentary, it's like, well, you know what? Th this suffering servant poem, for a long time, people didn't know what to do with it. And then the New Testament came around and Jesus came on the scene. And then it did start to gain traction among Christian communities. So maybe that is what it was intended to mean and why not, right? And we still use it today. I am one with my God. My God is with us, all of us, at all times and in all places.